course, we've been seeing a lot of attacks on people based on race, but also just based on the fact that they have coronavirus. I think it's highlighting differences. It's not necessarily race-based. But I, it, I, I absolutely disagree. Coronavirus. Just coronavirus. COVID-19. We were really in isolation. You're looking at the face of a COVID-19 survivor. My first thought was, no I'm going to keep just came out of nowhere. Hi, my name is Angela Sun. I'm in Los Angeles, California, and I am a journalist and documentary filmmaker. Hi, I'm uh, Pascal, and I live in Luxembourg in Europe, and I work in IT. Hi, I'm Megan from Cape Town, South Africa, and I'm a businesswoman and entrepreneur. Hi, I'm Joe. I'm in Los Angeles, California, and I create YouTube videos. Hi, I'm Carmen. I'm an integrative medical doctor and health coach, and I'm based in Durban, South Africa. Hi, my name is Joe. I'm a physician in the emergency room in Connecticut and also in the intensive care unit, uh, and I'm a COVID beater. I thought I would die from coronavirus. Three, Two, one, go. I never get sick. And then all the symptoms just hit you at once and they don't stop and it gets worse and worse and worse. I've never lost my vision before like that. I've never been so weak before in my life. And like even my girlfriend, she thought that she was gonna come in and I was just gonna be laying there. Especially at the beginning it was a very scary experience. There were nights where I woke up and I was gasping for air and I couldn't breathe at all. And uh, I developed insomnia afterwards because uh, every time I went to bed at night, I was like, I don't want to go to sleep because I'm going to die like during my sleep. So it was uh, it was very, very stressful at some point. I didn't think I was going to die. But when I had to go to the emergency room and I'll never forget, I had such a problem breathing. I really got concerned at that point that I was suddenly going to get much, much worse and end up uh, on a ventilator. You guys, I'm so sorry to hear that you were so sick. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. I had symptoms. The weakness really was the thing that, that bothered me. And then you kind of always have this thing in your mind, like, is this going to get worse? Is this going to get worse? And then just day by day, it started getting better and better. And I was like, wow, I couldn't believe. I didn't have a fever. I didn't have the shortness of breath. None of that stuff. Once I turned the corner, I definitely knew that I was over the worst. Coronavirus has prompted racism and xenophobia. Three, two, one, go. Where, where I work, the people who are having the worst time, the people who are intubated and uh, the people who aren't, aren't making it, the African-Americans and Latinos, it kind of explains that there are massive social differences between uh, different populations in America. And that's a real issue. And, we'll, and as the data comes out, we're just going to see how much it attacks the underserved and minorities. And it's awful. As an Asian American experiencing this in Australia, when I did go to the market, I had my mask and my gloves on to go shopping to, you know, protect myself and other people. I had someone take pictures of me and they're all staring at me. And I'm just like, let me just get out of here. Let me just get out of here. So I'm from the Bay Area. So I was hearing these stories firsthand from friends who were being spat on, yelled at, called names. I've seen a lot of the videos and I've seen about the, the stabbing in Texas. And so I think it's uh, such a regression from where we were moving forward to, which was the bridging of cultures. And it's just really unfortunate. So I was very fortunate to join one of the organizations that I have contributed to, putting food parcels together for the huge number of people in South Africa who are really hungry right now because they just do not have means to get food on their table. I got to see how so many communities are coming together to try and solve the problems that we are all being faced, not because of who you are or where you've come from, but simply because the corona is affecting your life right now. Racism is something that South Africa has been dealing with for a very long time. But I think from that day and just experiencing the way that so many communities are coming together, 
it was such a positive, uplifting day. Of course, we've been seeing a lot of attacks on people, yes, um, based on race, but also just based on the fact that they have coronavirus. And so I think that, you know, it's difficult to say, is it really truly a racism thing? Or is it just a response to fear? And maybe corona infection looks a certain way to certain people. And maybe that's highlighting some of the underlying discrimination that was perhaps already there. I think it's highlighting differences. It's not necessarily race-based. But I, it, I, I absolutely disagree. And I think it is absolutely race-based because you guys in are America. in America. Maybe not South Africa. I think it's not South different. Africa. Not South Africa. But in America and in parts of Australia where there have been huge, there have been hate crimes. People have gotten beat up simply because they're Asian. Um, it's a massive deal. Like, it sucks. It sucks that my mom is freaking out about going to the grocery store because they target older Asian people because they can. We didn't really get any, you know, racist reactions over here, but I can understand Angela. And I'm really, really sorry this is happening over there. I'm going to choose my words carefully here, but if there are leaders uh, very high on top that's uh, called the virus Kung flu or the China virus, I think that is influencing the population. I infected someone else with the virus. Three, two, one. Oh. I definitely gave it to my girlfriend. She was taking care of me and she starts feeling even worse than I was. It was just nuts to see like the person to person transfer of how like I had it pretty bad and then she had it worse and like she had migraines and headaches for like three weeks, four weeks. We got sick when we were overseas on our ski trip in Switzerland and we traveled home being sick and having full symptoms but having no idea that it was corona. Ooh. When we got home we did notify the airline that we had tested positive and we left it up to them to notify all of the passengers etc. But I've got no way of knowing whether we infected anyone on the plane or not. We have a downstairs uh, basement and I went into uh, Corona quarantine for two weeks. We have five kids all together. We had a four week old baby who I actually still haven't picked up. It's actually very sucky because uh, I, I get to get near him and I've tested negative twice now from my nose, but we're really a little concerned. So we just, I don't pick up the baby, which sucks because he's my third son and I don't get to see him, but you don't have to change his diaper either. So there's, there's always a specific <laughs> line. My country has handled COVID-19 better than other countries. You Three, really ask two, us. one, go. So I kind of agree for my country. I know that uh, we went on lockdown. We weren't allowed to go out. The government sent us free masks over when uh, all the masks were unavailable. We get free tests as well. We get serology tests so to see if we are immune or not. So we're doing a lot here, but I only know from this place, but I don't know from, from the other places. So uh, I'd like to hear what's going on in the world. From the perspective of experiencing it in Australia, at the time, I felt like my rights were being infringed on a bit because I was literally put in the hospital isolation. All my other friends who had it were just told to stay home and quarantine and isolate for 14 days. We were told we would get a fine, like a hefty fine if we even tried to leave or anything. From my Australian friend's perspective and other people's perspective, from a place that has universal health care, they were thinking, wow, she's getting the treatment that she needs and I can't believe they're doing above and beyond for a foreigner. I'm just talking medically. If we could have contact traced the way uh, Angela said they did in Australia and if everyone could have been tested quickly and we'd worked out that everyone just needs to isolate, that if we're wearing masks and we're not getting close to each other, you're not gonna spread it, we could have done in the beginning a better job. I think we now have it together. And I do think that we've all realized quite how serious this actually is. I think this is a really tough question to answer because I think it's impossible for one country to handle um, every single aspect of this disease and the knock-on effects of it perfectly. And I mean, like, I feel proud of the way that my president has been addressing us and handling this. But at the same time, I've got a lot of questions about what's going on 
and why that certain decisions are being made. To dovetail on Megan, because we're both South African, coming from the medical perspective in this country, and it's difficult to say that we, we did things better than other countries, but I do think that we acted incredibly for a developing nation. I think the fact that we went into lockdown so early, the fact that I saw the drastic change from the healthcare system just a couple months ago where we really were not prepared to what it is now. I can honestly say that we have done a lot. I think that we should be incredibly proud of ourselves as South Africans. The media has blown COVID-19 out of proportion. Three, two, one. Angela, I just want to say this is not in any way to attack you as a journalist, but I would say that some of the panic that started in the beginning, I really thought the press was a little irresponsible. My patients are terrified that everybody is just going to die and this is going to be it. And it's going to be 15th century or 12th century Europe. And there was one famous the magazine and it, the, the, the line was, this is how Corona is going to kill you. And I thought to myself, that is not helpful. I can't really speak for American media, even though... I am part of the American media because I, I miss that frenzy. You know, I've shared my story on, on my socials and just because I think when you personalize it, it becomes real when it's your friend, right? All of us, our friends have probably told us like, wow, like you telling me about it or just knowing that you had it makes it so much more real for me. I think there's just no balance as far as everyone's just trying to get like the worst because that's what's going to get the most clicks. I've been documenting my whole story from the beginning and posting on Facebook and YouTube, and the number one response is, thank you for sharing that Like you can heal, you can be better. Like I filmed us going to the drive-through line, getting tested, they're like, oh my God, this is happening. Whereas like everyone's just seeing like, oh, this is the hospital room, this is where people are dying. By far my, my largest uh, view on Facebook was when I was sick, and I did this for a specific reason. I, I wasn't trying to self-promote, I was trying to explain, this is actually what happens, and we are gonna be okay, which is one of the reasons why I like this panel is that this is people who've, kicked COVID, they won and COVID lost because everyone just thinks they're going to be the 2% who are just not going to make it. I went public as well and so gave a few interviews uh, on TV here and to the newspapers just to inform people that not everybody is dying from this, uh, you know, like Joe said. I also got some feedback, unfortunately, from people who looked at me as if I was like some sort of monster, as if it was my mistake that I had contracted uh, COVID-19. Yeah, I just, I wanted to inform people and I did. It's a pandemic. Okay, so it's got all the makings of a potential sensationalized story. I think we have to remember that according to, you know, what we can see from the media, that there's a general trend, and I think now a little bit more than usual, for like, clickbaity stories. But I think that there are some responsible media outlets and responsible journalists out there. I think that's a difficult one to try and balance. I support stay at home orders. Three, two, one, go. Everybody needs to wear masks. Everybody needs to social distance. And everyone needs to be sensible about this. And if we do that, I think on a limited fashion, we can get on and a lot of industries that are able to start moving forward can move forward. There was such an obvious reduction when we had social uh, distancing. I don't think we all need to be at home, though. I think we can go out. It depends on how we do that. It's just, I think you just need to be smart with what you're doing. Two days ago was the first time I went out in public. I went to the bank. And there was just one guy without a mask. And just seeing him walk by me was like terrifying. Well, I did an uh, immunity test to see if I was immune uh, for the virus. And uh, apparently I'm not immune anymore. So I think we should continue to be very careful and stay at home. I think it's a good idea. People who are still very vulnerable to getting severe infection should be staying at home. But I definitely do think on the other side of that, that the economy does need to start reopening. For example, in South Africa, we have a huge portion of the population that is unemployed. And as a result of this lockdown, that has driven those people even into a worse situation. And so it cannot continue like this indefinitely. All I can speak to is California, specifically LA. The population density here does not really allow for proper social distancing. What I asked the doctor, the infectious disease specialist, he was saying that he doesn't think it can properly 
reopen and the stay-at-home orders be lifted until there's a scientific advancement. I do agree that we should, at least in my specific area, still heed the orders. I don't like being told what to do. I don't like I don't like having to stay at home. But do I think it's the right thing to do? Yeah, I mean, and I also don't think that we have enough information to make that decision. We've got to trust in our leaders. And so whatever decisions our leaders are making, it's up to us to stick to that because I think that whatever that decision is, the most important thing is that we all act together to get through it. I know someone who has died from coronavirus. Three, two, one, go. Oh, that's sad. Somebody who once um, hired me to do a job, he got it. And when he went to the hospital, it was before they had the available testing. They told him they think he has it and for him to not come back because he had it. And he ended up passing away, like, I think two days later. Yeah, one of the jobs I had was at the Medical Research Council and the lead researcher doing incredible work in HIV, women's health and preventative medicine. Unfortunately, after coming back from the UK, um, succumbed to uh, COVID-19. I lost a friend and mentor from AAJA, the Asian American Journalists Association. She's a CBS journalist and one of the first in New York to contract it and unfortunately passed. And it's like, it's just not fair, right? Like how come we're here and, and they're not? And then another instance where I know someone who has been affected with the knock-on effect of committing suicide because of being in isolation and having mental health issues from before, but this definitely exacerbated that. I have had multiple, I mean, countless patients who died of corona over the last three, two, three months, more than I've really ever seen. At some point, all the doctors are going to have to try and process what we just saw. And it's just awful to watch. And you know what the saddest thing is, is that a lot of the time they're dying alone. You just, as a human, it's just awful that this person's by himself, but his family is trying to FaceTime in. It's just the whole thing is tragic. It's tragic. This has changed my life forever. Three, two, one, go. I have been in quarantine with my parents and I'm now in lockdown with my parents and the quality time that I've been able to spend with my family, I would never have been able to spend. And I value this time so, so hugely. That's changed me for the positive. I have a better relationship with everyone in my family as a result. The interviews that I've done and the people that I've spoken to and the sort of doors that have been opened to me from that perspective has, has also changed my life. Yeah, it was fun with me, uh, you know, my 18-year-old teenage son to be, uh, you know, home with him. <laughs> <laughs> it changed uh, my life because uh, I've rarely been this sick. I don't think I've ever been this sick, actually. Joe, if you'll agree <laughs> with this, it's, it's always a very interesting experience when you go from one side of medicine to the other uh, so from being the healer to being the patient that experience and that shift in the dynamic is a really eye-opening experience with the uncertainty and the questions and the lack of control and just you know shifting your mindset media interest has been phenomenal as well it's very important for all of us to be speaking about our experience because it adds to what we were saying earlier about bringing some balance into the story that's being narrated to the people who are waiting and watching the one thing I want to just say about plasma is I think there's a beauty to the idea that you beat corona and now you're going to save somebody else's or potentially multiple people's lives. And that is the most unifying thing. It doesn't matter the race. It doesn't matter the class. You are going to save somebody's life that you're never, ever going to meet if you give them your plasma. I was able to give one bag and the nurses were treating me like I was like, God's gift. You are my friend. Each bag can save four people. And they're saying that they're seeing results literally the next day where people are turning around like 100%. And that's just like the most fulfilling thing to really hear. I have like my next appointment in a couple of weeks and you're able to give it every month. So if anyone has it or anyone watching, you can help out and give it You know, I think this pandemic has brought the best and the worst out of people. The thing that I grab towards is that we're in it together. Wherever you are in the world, we're all going through the same thing. And that is a wrap. Thank you. I want to show everybody my t-shirt, by the way, just in case. Oh, nice. <laughs> exactly. Good for you. Good for you.